The counteroffensive is dead. Long live the counteroffensive that hasn't yet started. Now, before you start shouting at us in the comments, just hang on a minute and let us explain. There's been a lot of confusion about the Ukrainian operations on the front line right now, partly because both sides benefit from distorting the truth. And we've seen a few people ask if we can consider this offensive dead, as well as tons of Russian claims that they defeated the counteroffensive before the ground attacks even started. To top it all off, there are odd Ukrainian claims that the offensive hasn't even started yet. And the obvious answer to the first of these statements is that no, this counteroffensive hasn't died or finished yet, at least not as of late June 2023. I know that the recent footage, and there's been a lot of it, of destroyed, damaged, or abandoned Western equipment has shattered the expectations of many. But an operation such as this does not hang on a handful of Western MBTs and IFVs. When discussing this year's Ukrainian counteroffensive, a lot of people, especially in the West, expected something like Kharkiv last year. A quick blitz through the Russian lines capturing lots of territory and equipment. However, that is far, far removed from what we're seeing. And that's mostly because we're all thinking of the wrong operation. The real parallel should actually be drawn with the Kherson counteroffensive, which lasted two and a half months and for most of it was a costly, deadly slog with little to show for the effort and blood poured into it. So much so that the media sometimes forgot about it even when it was ongoing. For those of you who have not followed the events closely or are new to the Ukraine conflict, the Kherson counteroffensive was the main Ukrainian attack last year. It was focused on the territories held by the Russian army to the west of the Dnieper, mainly centered around the city of Kherson the only regional capital the Russians had actually managed to capture during the invasion. And the Kherson counteroffensive had the same pattern we've seen now, with direct attacks on well-fortified, well-manned, and prepared Russian positions, with significant and painful losses for the Ukrainians and the Russians alike. And they were well-fortified, manned, and prepared because, just like with this counteroffensive, Ukraine decided to announce to the whole world well ahead of time what it was going to do which was, and still is, a frankly bewildering thing to do, as militaries usually expend a lot of effort into making sure their plans are kept secret. Why did Ukraine do this? There are multiple possible reasons, such as shoring up morale and their own will to fight, as a PR stunt for the West to raise support and get some more equipment, and in order to gather Russian forces on the west bank of the Dnipro, where they then strangled their logistics chains. The more stupefying thing is that it worked. It was one of the rare instances in history of a clearly announced operation into the teeth of a well-prepared opposing army actually succeeding. And it not only succeeded in throwing the Russians out from the west bank of the Dnieper, it also made them concentrate their forces, leaving a largely undefended front line near Kharkiv. This led to the famous Kharkiv counteroffensive, in which a relatively small number of Ukrainian units broke through the Russian lines and a veritable blitzkrieg, reaching the Oskil River, roughly 50 kilometers from the front line, in a week, and then continuing over the next two weeks and liberating 12,000 square kilometers of territory. We're not saying if this success will repeat itself now or not, but just like in Kherson, this one will be a slog, it'll be slow, and there will be a lot of losses. Also, one of the reasons this isn't over yet is that, to the best of our knowledge, there are a good deal of units and equipment that we know exist in Ukrainian hands and haven't yet appeared on the battlefield. What their status is, and if they're combat ready, is something we do not know, but by all probabilities, they seem to be still in play. What we're seeing right now is the start of a long, attritional battle, a deadlocked chess game in which each side tries to exhaust the other and open up a vulnerability, just like last year at Kharkiv. The Russians are hoping that they can tire out and wear down the Ukrainian offensive units, while the Ukrainians are trying to exhaust Russian logistics and manpower reserves to open up a gap somewhere. To the best of our understanding of this conflict, this will not be fast. This will not be a sprint. This will be an endurance race of whoever can bleed the other out. It is and will continue to be extremely costly in ammunition, in equipment, and young men dying or being wounded on both sides. And it's also important to note that whatever we're seeing being published is lopsided. The Russians are publishing whatever helps their narrative, and the Ukrainians, 
while not in a complete silencio stampa, are rather restrained with what they're publishing. What we're seeing is a small portion of the picture. Whatever the whole picture is, only God knows. The Ukrainian counterclaims that the offensive hasn't even started are also just propaganda, and they're contradicting themselves because there are messages for different audiences, and confusion also helps them to a certain degree. Complex operations such as this counteroffensive are not clear-cut affairs in time, as there are a lot of elements around the edges that are harder to ascertain and often ignored. There are shaping operations, preliminary strikes on logistics and command, reconnaissance in force, probing, secondary attacks, diversionary attacks, the main effort, securing the occupied areas, etc. Now, almost all of the elements that precede the main effort have already taken place or started in earnest, according to publicly available information. The only thing that is still unclear is if the main effort has started yet or not. But unless you're on the Ukrainian high command, that's rather impossible to answer right now. Ah, and a comment on the pile of destroyed, damaged, and abandoned Leopard 2s and Bradleys near Orkiv. Yes, that is a big and painful loss for the Ukrainian army, and a rather large failure on the part of the units involved. But it's important to note that they shouldn't really be blamed. These vehicles were announced in mid to late January, so even if they would have arrived in Ukraine on the day of the announcement, the crews and commanders would have gotten, at best, less than five months of training. In reality, it was significantly less. Now, we know that many think that Western training is probably better than Russian training, but in no way, shape, or form can a severely abbreviated tank course, even one made in the West, properly prepare the crews for this kind of combat. That is to say nothing of the commanders. This incident and these losses have been a direct consequence of the West's prevarication when it came to sending Ukraine modern AFVs, among other things. We did say in our previous videos covering Ukraine that we shouldn't expect Western AFVs to come to the front line before late May, early June. And we were right about that, but we were also wrong. Even that timeline was not and never could have been enough to properly prepare the Ukrainians to properly operate these vehicles in an effective fashion. But it is now up to them to make do with what they have and learn from these losses. The Western delays, indecision, and endless wrangling have had a direct cost in blood and human lives, to say nothing of the equipment. And that's all we have to say on the current Ukrainian counteroffensive as of late June 2023. We hope we've not been too depressing, but in all the confusion and ecstatic overclaims on both sides, it's important to keep a cool head and try to see the bigger picture. Also, if you like this kind of content and would like us to do more, let us know in the comments. Until next time, keep us in your sights.